Come on, lighter. Um, oh, the interpreter slides, I apologize. Can't see our candle. Oh, look at all these beautiful faces. Okay, I'm gonna cue it over to our um, interpreters to kick us off, please. Can everyone see my screen where I'm sharing my slide? Yes. Are our interpreters ready to begin? Thumbs up, yes. Okay. We cannot hear them, so no, you can't hear. Oh, okay. I just don't know when to go to the next slide. I apologize. Um, if folks need access to interpretation, uh, you may follow the directions on uh, this, this, what you see on your screen here. And then um, at the bottom of your, at the right hand end of your computer, you'll see a globe. And that is where you will select interpretation. You will select um, the language that you need. And then now I have the slide up for, Okay, for uh, the Spanish version of this. And I don't want to over talk the Spanish translation, but Cedric, if you are ready to share your screen, I will stop share in just a moment. If I can get a thumbs up. Cedric, are you ready? Cedric, you're muted, love. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to get everything together for our presentation. So just bear with me just a second. Um, okay, sorry. Hello. Hello, Don. Thanks for joining. If everyone can stay muted until we do question and answer at the end, but thanks for being on. Yeah, we're definitely so excited to see all these beautiful faces. I don't want to do like romp room and start shouting out names, but Not we're really. just so grateful. <laughs> oh, wait, that's telling my age, ain't it? Talk about romp <laughs> room. <laughs> well, we are so super duper excited. <laughs> um, but yes, we're so excited to have you all here today. And um, of course, our esteemed colleagues, my brother and sister in chains, Kamaria and Cedric and myself will be um, giving you the pleasure of, of what happened here in Virginia. Well, we did all of this amazing stuff and then also providing you some, some other stuff. So as Cedric is is queuing up our goodies. Our so goodies. Great. Yes, I am trying to get uh, Zoom to have access to this. So one second, bear with me. I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> I thought I had this all queued up, but clearly 
my computer said otherwise. So just give me another second. No problem. If you need support on me sharing screen, let me know. Got it. Um, just trying to pull up the system preferences. There we go. There we go. Okay. This technology, y'all. And if you all have questions, please don't hesitate. Put that into the chat box um, as well. Please don't hesitate. We have amazing folks that are checking the chat or, you know, you can send it there. And remember when you're in the chat, because um, I've been doing this, make sure at the top it says instead of all panelists that it says panelists and attendees when you're doing your response, unless you want it just to come to the panelists. So I just want to, um, to make sure to lift that piece up. Um, and if anything too, another part that I would like for everyone to do is just take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Let's do one more deep breath in and a deep breath out. Um, this is honestly some ways that we start our coalition calls and with all of our crew just to kind of center us and get us prepared and ready for the day. Um, the other thing that we do is normally scream, but we're not gonna do that today. Okay, so we have options for screaming and we do breathing exercises in our coalition meeting because sometimes y'all, you're gonna have to scream in order to, to let it out and get it done. How are we doing over there, partner? Almost there, sorry, I got it. It's a little while to authenticate, but we good. Okay, All right. Share and let's see if this works. Okay, I think we're good. <laughs> okay, I am so sorry, everyone. Um, let me get myself together. All right, so welcome to the breakout session, Creating Coalitions and Networks Centered on Activism, Advocacy and Organizing Through HIV, Criminalization, Modernization. Today, your presenters will be myself, I'm Cedric Pulliam, and the illustrious Ms. Deidre Johnson, or Ms. Deidre Johnson Speaks, or Deidre Speaks, and then Kamaria Laffrey from The Serial Project. Um, and we are really glad to be here with you all today. So just so that you know, we'll, we'll be discussing things on defining and discussing criminalization effects on those convicted under the laws and the outdated origin of these laws across the U.S., highlight some of the, the number of specific uh, states currently with HIV specific laws, um, highlight states that have changed these laws and examine what states in the South are doing, specifically Virginia. And also we'll look at discussing the impact outside and contributing factors to enforce further marginalization of vulnerable communities and how that goes beyond the courtroom and intersects with racism, bigotry, classism, and does not improve or protect public health and public health in uh, general um, idea as well. So first off, um, what is criminalization? I will punt this over to my esteemed colleague, Kamaria. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me be a part of this breakout session. Uh, HIV criminalization, it's the term that refers to an overly broad and outdated, super outdated uh, use of criminal laws that penalize the alleged perceived or potential HIV exposure, alleged non-disclosure of a known HIV positive status prior to sexual contact, contact and also includes acts that don't risk HIV transmission or non-intentional HIV transmission. It's also the inappropriate use of criminal law to address a public health issue. These laws that apply um, are applied exclusively to people living with HIV and they fuel stigma and increase barriers to accessing care. Um, five things to know that we like to remind people to know about HIV, especially when we're doing like our one-on-one -on -one education, is that these laws do not work as intended. These laws do work against public health. These laws absolutely don't align with current science. These laws do increase stigma and discrimination, preventing people from wanting to get tested and knowing their status. And these laws do not make sense at all for our justice system, as you will hear about later from Deirdre and Cedric. So in um, the Sarah Project, I forgot to say that's who I work for. Sarah Project has been um, a part of this work along with other uh, national partners since roughly 2012. 
Um, since then, in 2020, 68% of people living with HIV in the US resided in 32 states with specific laws or enhanced sentencing against people living with HIV. Among these 32 states with HIV um, criminalization laws, 25 of them have prosecuted people living with HIV under general criminal laws. And as you can see on this map, um, your yellow states are the specific laws related to HIV status. Um, your kind of light cornflower blue color is enhanced sentencing states. Um, and then your orange ones are the states that have, have either enhanced or specific laws criminalizing uh, HIV status. And your navy blue is neither enhanced or specific laws criminalizing HIV. Can you hear me? Um, yes. Is that, yes, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I did see a note from the interpreter asking you to slow down. I and I did. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure you saw that. Thank you. So intersectionality is um, centered around our issues of race, gender, sexual orientation, and poverty which impacts marginalized communities that are already vulnerable to acquiring HIV with discriminatory enforcement. And as you can see in this image here, all of these, our gender, our class, our religion, our age, all overlap and intersect um, our social identities. Um, social drivers such as poverty, racism, mass incarceration, violence, and others um, impact us on ways that a biomedical response can't fix everything. And if we don't address these out, outer issues or these inner issues um, and provide more resources for individuals that are impacted by these laws, then we're not really solving any, any problem. Changing the laws, we can't just stop there. We also have to look at the systems that support these laws. Next slide. So one of the ways that we make sure that in this fight that we're in to change these laws is to have the meaningful involvement of people impacted by the laws. And in the work that I do at Sarah Project, it's specifically for people living with HIV. We want to ensure that networks of people living with HIV are able to determine their own agenda, define their own priorities and select the leadership of their own choosing, specifically in the coalitions that they create to help not just fight the laws, but to help mobilize, to educate lawmakers, to educate public health officials, to educate community-based um, organizations. We also want to make sure that the people um, that are leading these efforts and that meaningful involvement also has the opportunity to hold leadership accountable and that they speak with a collective voice. People living with HIV that are working together with other people living with HIV contribute significantly to the improved health outcomes and stigma reduction. And so some of the methods that, or some of the strategies that are utilized in the criminalization coalition efforts, um, first make the decision of whether they want, well, not first, but one of the decisions they make is whether they want to modernize um, repeal or decriminalize. And uh, some spaces in political, in the political efforts, it, de it depends on like what your culture of your legislatures are on what term you would use. Also what method is going to be most effective and beneficial for your community. People living with HIV and the majority of the folks that are part of this work, all definitely absolutely 100%, as far as the ones that I've heard from, absolutely want repeal. They want full repeal of these laws. They don't need to be on the books at all. Other um, states, many states have had to make the decision between modernizing um, or repealing. And in some states, using the word decriminalize, even though that's your method, that's your path, using that phrase can be a trigger for some legislatures, legislators um, because that word might be attached to um, different social groups that might um, cause legislators to not even hear what your issue is in the first place. Next slide. So some of the states that the Sierra Project has worked with are listed here um, in black. Our states that are listed in red are the states that have um, 
excitedly um, modernize or repeal their HIV laws. So California, Colorado, Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, and freaking Virginia, we celebrate you and we applaud you for the work that you've done um, in your state to change your laws. If Illinois was able to do a full repeal, Pennsylvania and Tennessee have advocates that have been actively working to prevent laws from being introduced. So they're staying on legislators' heels and making sure that they're holding their feet to the fire that they don't continue to criminalize people living with HIV. Next slide. So folks want to know how can they get involved? How do we bring this all together? How can they be a part of this movement? And there are a few ways. Um, you can provide testimony and leg legislate let it. <laughs> You can provide testimony and legislative hearings. <laughs> you can um, educate your community about HIV criminalization. You can get any advocate pretty much that's been doing this work to come and do an educational one-on-one. Um, you can contact national organizations to come and do education. There are plenty of webinars that are archived that have lots of information um, available to folks for uh, education. You can also encourage meaningful involvement of people living with HIV in your clinics, your community-based organizations, your uh, community advisory boards, your aid service organizations, talking to the people that are providing the services and then letting them know what other issues are impacting their clients before they walk in the door is instrumental in being a part of this education. And I think at this point, I get to turn it over to Cedric and Deirdre to let you know how they did all of this work in Virginia and killed it. Thank you. Well, little do y'all know, she's killing it, in, it not only at the Serum Project, but also at the Florida, um, in Florida as well on the criminalization laws. So thank you so much, Kamaria, for passing it on and always being our partner in change. Um, and we find that very, very instrumental in the work that we have created here in ECHO. Um, at ECHO. And so what is ECHO? Who are, are some of y'all heard of us? I know y'all have. I know y'all have. I know some of y'all sick of seeing us in the media. Guess what? We don't care because we want this information to get out. We want conversations to be happening. And this is why our journey towards ending HIV criminalization in Virginia is extremely important, especially for ending criminalization and over incarceration in Virginia Coalition or ECHO VA. Um, just a little bit of history and some landscape. We're going to go over just what our current laws are. Well, I'm saying current because them things gonna change come July 1st and we will talk about that right now. So uh, um, in a few seconds, but we're gonna talk about currently and why and how we got started. What was our role in the coalition and what we were doing in the coalition and then why it was extremely, extremely important to have meaningful involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS in Virginia. Um, it's unfortunate because right now, Timothy is leading an amazing session on MEPA um, and they were very instrumental in working on um, the Illinois uh, repeal. So um, if you haven't, I know some of us is going back and forth. If you don't know about MEPA and want to know more about how to get involved, um, please you know, check that out as well as continue to listen to what we're doing. So here currently in Virginia, here's what, well, even before that. So we got started for this thing. If it was not for a couple of folks, actually Cedric and I met at the last HINAC. Um, so that's 2018. So that says, you know, just in a whole lot of levels, we've had how many years? Three. I think my math is right. Three. Um, since we were created and founded to where we are today and what we were able to do in the last few months, specifically on the law change. Um, some of the reasons why we decided to get involved and start this whole coalition was simply because when we go to these opening sessions in person, there was only a few of us from Virginia sitting at that table and that happened to be myself, Cedric and another advocate everyone is, um, knows about and that is Monica Charleston. What we found out first and one thing that we ask if you haven't already is check out your state laws and find out what is going on in your state in, in regards to HIV and criminalization. What we found out was that we had a law and my favorite infected sexual battery. And that was in, it, it goes into engaging in any sexual activity with intent to transmit. And we love the quotations on intent because we'll go back there simply because regardless if protection was used 
or if the person living with HIV was virally suppressed, you could still be charged under that particular law in addition to non-disclosure. Disclosure. So a person living with HIV had to disclose their status prior to any engagement in any uncertain sexual activities, um, regardless of intent. Um, and a lot of times we recognize that it was really um, one word against another word, and it really wasn't proof. It was just, you have to say it. Even more importantly, there were only three things that were stated in this law, and that's for HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis. And those were the only three things that were specified. That important information is going to come to light as to what we did and why we did what we did later. In addition to, of course, any general laws um, for criminal exposure to HIV, which could be malicious wounding, assault, et cetera. In addition to one of the last pieces was the uh, donation of, or sale of blood, body fluids, or organs. And that was a absolute, you can't do it or else you're gonna be charged with this. Um, some of the things that happened with our convictions, as far as if it was a class six felony, which would be the intent, uh, would have been a confinement up to five years and the misdemeanor would have been for disclosure. And that would have been jail confinement and up to 12 months with the possible fine as well, in addition to these things of $2,500. It was mandatory testing, isolation, quarantine, and of course, mandatory treatment. We already see that there are some you know, issues in that when we're talking mandatory testing and treatment, especially for those um, individuals that are engaging in sex work and or intravenous drug use. Um, so what we decided to do, and in this point, I'm actually gonna forward it over. Um, wait, no, nope, I think I'm still. Um, <laughs> um, so what we charged to do, our coalition met in November of 2018. There was about 20 of us that met from across the state. And we decided to, again, review the laws, find out. We reached out to allies and our people living with HIV in our efforts, as well as in our state and our commonwealth. And we worked through educating our public through outreach and other programming, like places like this and going into conferences and letting folks know that HIV is being criminalized across the country and also specifically in Virginia and how we would be able to, um, to change that. We worked with our political systems, our advocacy organizations, um, lobbyists, legislators. Some of us have been in grocery stores talking to folks, but we talked to anybody and everybody that we could across the state and made a letter campaign as well as spoke to universities and colleges to educate youth on HIV and criminalization as well. Of course, we, the other part for ECHO is we also, in addition to um, working on HIV criminalization, we also focus on over-incarceration in Virginia. And we know that with the intersectionalities that Kamaria specifically spoke about earlier, how important that is, because for us in Virginia, African-Americans make up only 19% of the population in Virginia. However, we account for over 58% of newly diagnosed HIV um, transmissions. So we realized that that's a problem. There's a disconnect. And how can we work with organizations that were also intersecting with HIV and incarceration? Next slide, please. And of course, our mission, the biggest thing that take away from our mission is that we are extremely, 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 extremely inclusive. Mm -hmm. And that is intentional because we don't want anyone to be left at the table or outside of the table or sitting at the kitty table trying to look in, trying to get in. We want everybody at the table because everyone has a voice. Everyone has something that they can contribute to this conversation. From the beginning to, I mean, Zero Project and Positive Women's Network really helped us to craft these missions and to move forward and to be into spaces so that we could be able to speak and talk to folks about the criminalization efforts that we were doing in Virginia. Um, we spoke to everybody, got on every panel and did everything that we could, but we were very intentional about being um, led by people living with HIV as well as being very intentional to include all Virginians. And I am going to now pass it over to my partner in change, Cedric, to talk about the political reality of Virginia. Um, we got a primary going on right now, y'all. And one of our co-sponsors is actually running for governor. So we'll have him to share that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, partner in change. Hi, everyone, and good afternoon, good evening. And 
I don't think good morning for anyone at this point, but uh, my name is Cedric Poyen, the co-founder of Echo VA Coalition, and I know I'm going to speak slower. I apologize. Um, so the political reality in the Commonwealth is that our governor is a Democrat. We have a 45 Republican, 55 Democrat split House as well, or Democrat majority, and then a 19 to 21 split Senate at the moment with Democratic majority. Um, like Deidre just mentioned, we have a governor um, as well as some of our uh, House uh, representative elections occurring this year. The primary is literally today, June 8, 2021, and the general election will be hosted on November 2nd, 2021. And of course, early voting is um, allowed in the Commonwealth of Virginia as well. Um, and these races are vitally important as Echo VA Coalition and partners continue our advocacy um, in the Legislative General Assembly throughout 2021 and onward, so 2022, et cetera. Uh, sorry about that. This is a picture from that November 2018 strategic planning meeting that Sewer Project helped uh, Echo VA Coalition host. Um, our members range from all across the state, even the rural areas close to West Virginia or close to, you know, some of like Roanoke, Virginia, et cetera, as well as the Northern and Richmond, Petersburg area, as well as the Hampton Roads and Virginia Beach area. So what has ECHO VA Coalition done since HINAC 3 in 2018? One, we created a strong coalition and network centered on activism, advocacy, and organizing. And we got Senate Bill 1138, which uh, will take effect July 1st as, as law in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And we'll, dis we'll discuss that. And also what our role was within that and also how important meaningful involvement of people living with HIV was in, in that work with Senate Bill 1138. So I wanna go over what um, Senate Bill 38, the wins are for us. Um, First to say, it modernizes infected sexual battery as a law within the Commonwealth. And also this is our, this is the Commonwealth of Virginia's HIV criminalization law. Um, and so modernizing it was very important. We wanted to, we also modernized the language to sexually transmitted infection throughout the entirety of the bill. And I'll come back to that as I get through the rest of these bullets. Uh, we modernized the criminal elements to include both proof of intent and actual transmission of a sexual transmitted, uh, sexually transmitted infection. This is important as um, I'll highlight as well later on. Then we repealed the disclosure element of infected sexual battery and repealed the testing statute that lies within the infected sexual battery law. And we also modernized the donation attempt to donate blood, organs, and tissue section of the law. And we modernized the mandatory testing requirements for any convicted sex worker and or drug users um, in that particular section of the law. The overall goal of Senate Bill 1138 was to effectively combat the HIV epidemic. Virginia's number, Virginia's number one party must, must continue to be to create an environment in which all people want and have access to HIV testing, treatment, and other prevention options, and modernizing infected sexual battery law is, our, is the key to ensure this public health strategy is successful. Um, just to briefly discuss um, the sexually transmitted infection and um, why we changed the language. Deidre pointed out that HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis C were the three pinpointed STIs um, that the, over time, since the late 80s, over time have been focused on um, with this particular law, as well as some of the criminal law when it comes to malicious wounding. Out of those three, HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis B, who can guess which one was the only prosecuted one of all of the STIs on those, out of those three? You got it, it was HIV. Um, out of the three plus decades <laughs> that this law existed on the books in the Commonwealth of Virginia, this, was, this law only prosecuted those living with HIV. Not one case had been prosecuted or brought to a prosecutorial level on syphilis or hepatitis C. So despite our wins, we still must fight for equity. What does that mean for us? So Echo VA Coalition and our partners understood from the beginning that a complete repeal of this law would not be possible in the Commonwealth of Virginia based on our history, based on the current makeup of our General Assembly and our governor. We just knew on the criminal law basis that it was not possible. So what did we do to get where we are today? We worked with our members, our partners, 
our public health officials and our member, one of the people in that photo uh, shown from November 2018 is our uh, NASDAQ director for the state of Virginia, as well as the chief of the division um, that focuses on HIV from the Virginia Department of Health. So we did have our Department of Health for the state level um, on our side and a champion for this work and this effort. So that's huge for uh, our coalition specifically having the health department from the state level really backing us up and helping and assisting us throughout this. So um, we all work together to draft the language, the best language that's most equitable and makes it the most difficult for a prosecutor to have an actual case against someone under the infected sexual battery that will, law that will go into effect on July 1st of 2021, just in a few weeks. One battle that we did lose though in Virginia is reducing the criminal punishment level. We had succeeded in the Senate, but when it got to the House, the House amended our bill to put back the classics felony level when we wanted the misdemeanor um, level offense. And so that's where our work continues. We will continue to fight we will continue to advocate and continue to educate regarding why this criminal punishment level should align with other things like assault and battery, which are at misdemeanor levels and things like that, and make the case and have support from um, our sponsors of this bill and hopefully other legislators um, for the 2022 legislative uh, session. So despite um, you know the soon to be modernized law, um, the the infected sexual battery law will still be at a class six felony. And this must change and we all agree that this must change. But we wanna reassure everyone, the ECHO VA coalition, its membership, our partners and other stakeholders would definitely like this law to no longer exist and be completely repealed and off the books. But as you can see, as I just explained, we did work step-by-step step collaboratively throughout this to really engage and to get everyone's opinion and everyone's recommendations on on how the language of the law should look and so it was a fully equitable process and um just wanted to really lay that out for everybody so senate bill 1138 was signed into law on march 31st 2021 by current uh, virginia governor northam and it takes effect on july 1st 2021 so yay just in a few weeks so what are next steps celebrate this victory. Um, as you saw from the Senate Bill 1138 wins, we accomplished a lot. And the last feat for this, this uh, journey is really getting that criminal punishment level reduced to a misdemeanor level. And hopefully in the future, continue this work and see a repeal. Hopefully we can get to uh, a Virginia legislator uh, makeup that will uh, go forward with an appeal. I mean, sorry, repeal of this uh, infected sexual battery law. And that's our goal. But stay tuned for a big announcement from ECHO VA Coalition and our partners on how we plan to celebrate this year, later in the year. Um, we are spearheading an advocacy campaign to change felony penalty level to a misdemeanor penalty level. We are working on modernizing other laws that prosecute communities impacted by HIV. So we're gonna be looking at other laws that have been intersect, ha had some intersectionality um, with a person living with HIV, whether it's sex work or um, drug use or you know any other kind of aspect, we're gonna do some digging to make sure that there's no other laws that we need to be advocating for to either modernize or change language, et cetera, um, with the laws in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And then we, of course, have to educate a lot with the effective law that goes into effect July 1st. We have to educate testing professionals in healthcare systems on the new law, the update to infect the sexual battery law. And so with that, uh, we will be, you know, working with our partners and the health department to really uh, cover language and help update any kind of training processes that occur throughout the state for maybe new HIV prevention workers or public health workers or testers um, throughout the state, as well as nurses doctors, providers, et cetera. So we have a lot of work ahead of us on the educational piece. And then the last piece is uh, work with community partners to continue to bring awareness about the changes to their organizations, the agencies, community, and legislators regarding the law. So it's an uh, ongoing effort uh, and the work does not stop. When it comes to getting the law modernized, you have a lot of work 
going forward from that um, and collaborative collaborating with other partners and stakeholders to really ensure message is clear. There's uh, that there's clear and it's the same, so that you're not saying different iterations of the language of you know what's new and you know how to understand the updates to this law. Everything has to be the same across the board, and so everyone has to be uh, on board and clear that language. So these are steps as you organize as uh, coalitions or networks to really ensure and embody collaborative partnership and work. Um, hearing voices, hearing every single person speak, even if they're quiet, even if it's a text or an email instead of on the call, following up with them to hear their feedback on decisions is very important. It's one thing that we do value. Even if it's a late night call, we're going to make sure to hear every single person's uh, recommendation or response on things. So that concludes our presentation for this session. And I think we will transition to questions and answers, but take down or screenshot, or uh, if you need to ask us any questions, the Echo VA Coalition email is there, justice number four, echo VA at gmail.com. And Kamari Laffrey at Zero Project, her email is there, kamaria.laffrey at zeroproject.com. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today and let's move to question and answers. So you can oh. stop sharing your screen so we can all see one another. Yes. To those beautiful faces. There, you go. Uh, there was a question in the chat. Uh, what challenges did you all face in the beginning? Hmm. Okay, so y'all know I ain't got no filter. <laughs> so I'm because, you know. Um, so let me be very clear. Um, one of the reasons that really sparked us to move into drafting SB 1138 was that there was, um, in the midst of all our educating and awareness um, through letting folks know about the fact that HIV criminalization existed in Virginia and it needed to be dealt with and talked with and everything else, there was um, a legislator. I'm going to be very, I'm going to be nice. I promise y'all, I'm going to be nice. There was a legislator that decided in that presentation that they heard um, one of us uh, discuss this on, and they decided to craft a bill, and um, no offense, it was crap. It did not include community. It did not include any discussion with any person living with HIV, and what was presented was just not going to be very good for our communities, period, any of our communities period. And so when we found out about it, we went and we got up on Hill and, you know, it's a whole bunch of other conversations we can get into, but we won't right now. But <laughs> long story short, um, we were able to kill the bill, um, working alongside with, uh, uh, specifically with Brianna, um, as well as Tyler from the Positive Women's Network, Sierra uh, Project. And then we also ended up finding and having through that connection, um, Equality of Virginia also ended up coming on board and working with us. So that's really what really got the ball rolling even more was like, we we're like, uh, uh, that bill is some garbage is not going to work for our communities. And it's going to further marginalize and impact communities in ways that it shouldn't. And that's when we decided to craft this bill. When we did present it to um, the legislative folks um, on, on Capitol Hill, thank you, Brianna Diaz, policy director over at, <laughs> at policy, at po all positive women's network and all of our efforts as a team in looking on reviewing and reviewing and reviewing our bill um we presented it and pretty much they were like so why don't y'all do a full repeal and we were like huh that sound good and then that's when at the last time at the last minute everything was going smoothly until the last minute when they decided to change things and add the um felony back on as well as some other thing that other piece to it and that's where we weren't going for it it is very important that you have your strategic planning documents that you review on the regular because those pieces were very instrumental in us making decisions when it came down to the wire we heard yesterday at our opening that Georgia at the last minute, everything was going smooth. And then at the last minute, some little monkey wrench, excuse me, a wrench came in and it ended up messing up the whole process and just a few hours before it was going to happen. So those were one of very many challenges that came, but the communication was extremely important to us as a coalition 
that we constantly were on calls. If something like that happened, and remind me, y'all, one of the Friday when some of this stuff came up, literally Cedric and I got on the call and on the phone and called all of our coalition members, not one or two, all of our coalition members, and between the two of us spoke to them all and got an answer as to what would they like to do when it comes to the um, moving forward when the felony was introduced. So it, there are challenges, but we came up with solutions in on the fly, and that is a part that you're going to have to um, really consider. And um, some folks think that it's just Cedric and I running this thing. Mm -mm. We got 30 folks that are on Echo VA's coalition that we are in consistent and constant contact with on the decisions that we are making. They specifically ask that Cedric and I lead this charge um, because of work obligations and other things. But what we did ask and what they were committed to doing was any resources that they had that they could bring to the table, they would, and they did. So um, those, I tapped on a few, I'm sure the Cedric has a few others um that we could definitely talk about as well no you did an eloquent job thank you so much Deidre see this is why my partner change is outstanding um an outstanding advocate and activist um I only wanted to just harp on something Deidre already mentioned as from the beginning that house bill 864 was the bill number um that was introduced what Deidre and I did not know is that we were being used actually because that delegate contacted the Alexandria Commission on HIV AIDS that I used to serve on and asked us to review this language or whatever. And we were not told that this was a bill draft. And Deidre and I, and it was a fast turnaround, like less than 24 hours, Deidre and I worked on it. And I'm in training at work. And all of a sudden, a week or so later, we see this bill is being introduced. And we're like, wait, is this what we just, and basically we were used. <laughs> and we we were used by saying to them, you know, like what we thought would be better or whatever. And they still didn't utilize that. So that's why we definitely wanted to kill that bill and were successful. So I just wanted to hype and hype that particular piece up because be mindful of things that you receive, because once you're known in this work in your state, people could you use you in the negative way. And you have to be careful and mindful. And Deidre and I didn't realize that to the after fact and was like, oh, but we have our ammo ready for you, which was working with our partners to kill that bill. Um, you know, one of the things that I wanna just provide um, my brothers, sisters, and any gender non-conforming individuals on the on the call today in this session, encouragement um, as you go through this journey. Deidre and I sat in that hall after lunch in Indianapolis in 2018 and said, and sat on the table from the entry and said, we have to make a change. Uh, we have to do something about this. And and from that point, we and we provided almost like a, a, a promise to each other that throughout this, whatever it, whatever it brings, positive, negative, good, bad, evil, whatever, that we would stay strong, we would work collaboratively, we would have MEPA principles at the top of our work with the coalition, and that we will uplift our membership and their views, and we will stick strong to that strategic planning document that we started June of 2018 and finalized in our November 2018 strategic planning meeting. And that's something I think when you have that as leadership or you know the leaders of this work, whether it's your network or coalition, I think if you're working alongside others, and I know some folks do this alone and have some folks come in and out, but make a promise to yourself and have some kind of like, <laughs> I don't even know, like, you know, folks to accountability partners almost, right? To to really support the work that you do throughout uh, the good and bad and the highs and lows, because it is, it is a trying time. Hearing some of the testimony and the responses from senators and representatives can crush your entire spirit. And to build back and to regain that strength and energy took Deidre and I to really work with each other um, and to, to, to cry, to scream on the phone together like letting it out really it's really something that you really have to 
have a balance and know your strong points and your weak points and things that you need to maybe bounce to someone else in your coalition. But those things are very critical and crucial that you think about um, for encouragement reasons to continue this work because trust me, some of the some of the things I heard said, I was like, turn my camera off, slam my computer closed and had to be like, no, Cedric, we have to educate this person. <laughs> This person is uneducated on this topic and opened back up that laptop, signed back in and was just ready to go in full blast mode of people living with HIV first, people, people first language being utilized, anti-stigma and just educational pieces really to harp on the response of that particular Senator. So I just want to encourage you all stay encouraged, be encouraged, and reach out and utilize other state advocacy coalitions and networks in your work. Um, join those calls that Zero Project hosts with the all the other state coalitions and networks because you'll get encouragement. You'll, you'll hear about this strategic plan document um, or other tidbits and best practices or lessons learned from other states in their work. So that's what I wanted to add here. And I definitely want to um, add in there, I see that Carrie has put a, a question in the chat box as far as engaging community and, and keeping in community engaged. One of the things that we, we were very adamant about was going and speaking to the community advisory boards, um, the Virginia Department of Health with their community, um, oh goodness, it just community planning group um, and consistently having conversations with Virginia Department of Health and letting them know about the work that we were doing. And so they were able to provide that information to the folks that they were funding as well as community. Um, in addition to always like just keeping it relevant. If we're um, you know sharing stuff on Facebook, um, those kind of things, social media, um, getting support from community and putting this stuff up, you all just showing up today um, to hear more about the work and then sharing that amongst your networks and then saying, hey, I know somebody in Virginia that's doing this. And then it's kind of, you know, went from there. Um, the other piece is, is that with that MEPA, when one person um, that was really instrumental um, in this work was we actually had a person who had been criminalized under our law and we utilized and spoke with them first and foremost um, they were very adamant that they wanted to be a part of this process and asked how could they help and if they could speak up and speak out. And by their testimony, providing that testimony was very helpful um, so that folks saw, you know, the face behind why this law is important to be repealed or changed. Um, the other piece is, is that even I have to be honest, um, again, I'm transparent, um, no cut cards, however you want to say it. We even have pushback from our community and advocacy. Um, Cedric and I got a couple of emails from some folk um, asking and inquiring about some stuff on what we were going to do. And the one piece that I'm going to say to every state that is represented right now is what happened, what is going on in your state may not work for some other states or for no other groups. And so you're going to know what is going to be best for your state, your locality, and you have to make sure that you let those folks know I am the subject matter expert in my state. That includes even letting legislators know I am the subject matter expert when it comes to HIV criminalization in any intersect that comes between that. And sometimes it may, I know I had a difficult time because I'm like, oh my God, I'm talking to a legislator, blah, 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 blah. But then I had to stop and think, you put your drawers on the same way I put mine on. Yours might be a thong, it might be commando, yours might be from Walmart, they might be Gucci, I don't give a rat's behind. But guess what, one leg at a time, boo, and we doing this together. So your stuff don't smell no better than my stuff. And we're going to work together to make this thing happen. And um, that's where I had to lean on Cedric because y'all see my analogies and how I have to come across. And sometimes that ain't professional and come across right. But when you get frustrated from being, oh, yes, and sir, and assimilating and doing that. And then finally, you just like literally I had to tell this man, don't do that. Don't even set me up calling me a poster child. So you have to stand up and know your worth, know you are valuable, know your voice is valuable. Even if folks don't see your face in this space, even if you write a letter, an email, put a call, whatever it is, share it on your Facebook page, you are helping us do this work and you are also doing this work. Yeah. So I encourage you to not be 
intimidated by someone that has an A, B, a C, or a D behind their name, simply because um, I think I was dubbed back in, in PWN, I think that was Bob Cardell, to be frank, to say, I have a PhD in HIV. And so if you haven't been told ever in your life, you have a PhD in HIV. And that is, even if you're not living with HIV, there are several members on this call right now that are not living with HIV that bust their butts to make sure that all the resources that we need and all the resources that they need are available to make themselves successful in this work. So, you know, sometimes it's a balls to the wall attitude but it's going to get the work done and you have to keep going. Yes, I spent a lot of sleepless nights, not going to lie. Um, mm -hmm. Worried to death that the decisions that we were making were going to be great and not going to intentionally cause undue harm to any community, any community, period. Because we all have children, family, et cetera, that are living in this commonwealth and we want that to be a better place. What has given me so much joy has been seeing the states that have gone and are working right now, the amazing work that each state has done, and then seeing all of you all show up. I think we've had about 43 people at our highest. We're at 40 right now to show up and listen and say, hey, what can I do next? How can I be engaged? And how can I you know, make sure and walk out for the pitfalls? Mm -hmm. The one piece, the last piece that I know I'm gonna leave each and every one of you with today be kind to yourself, be kind to yourself and be kind to yourself. Self-help, self-care is best care. And there have been times that I know personally, even I haven't taken that time out because I was so worried about the work that I haven't taken care of my personal. But what has been a joy is to see all of these chains. I always say partners and chains, all of these freaking partners and chains that are doing the daggone thing from showing up. I'm, I ain't gonna call folks out that's on here on Vice documentaries, Pope people in Mag Women's Day magazines. Folks is on all kinds of things and they're doing it and they're showing the whole world that you can live with HIV and do that damn thing. So I'm gonna need everybody just one thing to do. Just raise your arm up like this. Pull that joker down and say, toot, toot and toot your old damn horn for doing all the amazing work that you have been freaking doing in this work, whether it's been one year, 20 years, or a million years. So thank you, literally, those that, I haven't seen any other questions. There actually were two more questions. Oh, yeah. getting close to time. It's cool, it's cool. You were preaching, girl. You were, you were getting sacks. You were encouraging folks. You're getting all kinds of love in the chat box. Sure is. Um, <laughs> two of the questions I saw, and Deirdre, I feel like you already kind of answered. She answered that one, yeah. Yeah, I was, how are you able to take care of yourself doing this work? Cedric, you even spoke about it. It was just making promises to yourself, knowing your limits yeah. um, and self-care. The other question was, how do you avoid making a coalition or network members, not a members club, and making others feel unwelcomed? So how did you all go about making sure you were as inclusive as you could be? Inclusivity, as Deidre mentioned during our mission slide for Echo VA Coalition, that was one of our centerpiece uh, elements of, you know, gaining new members. I think one of the major strategies is really understanding the why they want to do the work. And when we had started recruitment the summer of 2018, we really asked that question of folks. Like we, of course, said, yes, you can be a part and do this work. But we, one of the questions that I remember Deidre not asking separately sometimes or collaboratively together sometimes is why do you, why are you, why is this work so important to you? And every member had always had no issue answering that because I've been working in HIV for 12 years and I know my sole purpose of why I continue to do this work and why HIV criminalization, modernizing that law was a, I will go to the grave working on it if I have to. And I knew that from the beginning, but if someone is just wanting to be on bandwagon land and just wanna be a part and do no work and just be there, you will know that by, by them answering that question. Cause either they're gonna spill out exactly why they're passionate or they're gonna give you a BS answer, excuse my language. But <laughs> I think that is, way, reach, I think that is a key. I'm gonna call you out. 
Yeah, we'll call you out very quick. And I think that's the key to realizing who's there to be there and to work and to ensure that this gets done and done collaboratively with everyone involved or just there to be there. And you're always gonna have some, a few folks that are just there to be there. They won't really do a lot, but we've had those folks, but when it was time to get them to do something, they actually did it. Even if it was just answering our call and giving us feedback yeah. and recommendations. Um, our state, I'm gonna say unofficially, our state motto is Virginia is for lovers. And um, we, in our, an echo we love everybody we love and one of the things um, you know some of y'all don't know i'm a crafter i um, <laughs> kind of fell out of the practice but one of the things we did at our session i made this little um thing and as you can see in our cat will would be the capital is a heart and one of the pieces that we do with echo is we leave with love and we know that you know love conquers a whole lot of things love is love and we are very very intentional about that piece and knowing that we are leading with love because we know what the rest of is going to follow. So um, even in my personal to the state is, you know, to the legislators, to the General Assembly, it was very clear, let us make this a state where we can really inclusively say that Virginia is a state for lovers. Um, and I love everybody. I do. I love everybody. We very are very also intentional. Um, as you can see, we kind of got to open. You see how our atmosphere is, even in our partner meetings when we would have conversations and things were going bad or bad or crazy or whatever. We did one of two things. Cedric would lead the breathing. I would lead like yelling. <laughs> and it would be like 10 seconds of screaming, whatever the heck that you felt like screaming, to let it out. And then we would follow up with breathing exercises. And checking in and not just saying oh how you doing today and then someone say oh okay and we'd be like okay and moving on no we were very strategic in saying if anyone that is working with us and for us if there's something going on do not hesitate to let us know so that we can work with you and work through the process um and i think i think that might be and I just want to I just want to uplift Carrie um, in her question uh, in this moment to say, yes, uh, sometimes Deidre and I really actually had those conversations with each other after a late night, like, dang, I wish all those folks from November of 2018 would actually be doing some of this late night work with us. And you kind of feel tokenized. And so uh, as leaders of the efforts, so um, the only way we got through that is the encouragement between each other. And I know when it's you solo, it's hard. I know for a fact that it's got to be hard, but just stick it out, stick, uh, stay, stay strong, reach out to those like us. We're here for you. Um, and, and Zero Project and PWN folks, they, they're there for you as well, but you can always reach out to us whenever you feel that way. Cause we've been there. Definitely. Call me girl. Call me now. It's like, God, call me. Cause I will chat, chat, we get on the phone. Some of y'all advocates that's on here know we get on this phone to get the kiki and ha-ha and all over the place just so that we can work it out. But we really echo leads with love. And um, we are so grateful to our partners at Zero Project. Um, we're also grateful to our partners at the Positive Women's Network. And we're also grateful to our partners at Equality Virginia. And we're also very um, grateful to our partners, um, Senator Locke and Senator McKellen, who led this charge. And let me say um, just one last piece. For those two women to get up there and to be Black women standing in a room of not Black women and to hear and to encourage um, to have to speak up for us living with HIV um, for because we were prepared with the notes. These folks showed up and showed out when they heard some very stigmatic and discriminating conversations. They were able to spit it out without having to read and say, um, and this no, they knew their stuff and they stood up and they stood strong for us. So when you're looking for champions and for partners that are going to be champion with you on these bills, make sure that they're not just doing it for that checkbox to get reelected, but that they are just to invest it and in, are invested into this work as well. 
Deirdre, Cedric, it's always a pleasure, a joy, an honor, a privilege to work with you all. Y'all are getting so much love. Y'all are making people emotional in the chat. I see tears on the screen. People needed to hear from y'all. We needed to celebrate y'all. We needed to be in this space to uplift those that are still doing the work and on this path. I always say that this is heart work, not hard work. You have to have a heart. You have to give a damn to be in this work. So I really appreciate you all for being a part of this. I appreciate everybody for showing up for the session today. Thank y'all for coming out for HINAC virtual. Like, I'm not even gonna do it right now. I'm gonna do it on Facebook later. I love y'all. Um, thank you all. Continue to go to the, um, the next sessions. Breathe, hydrate, love yourselves, and take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. I love everyone. Thank you. Rest you guys are gorgeous. Everyone is gorgeous. Man, all the, look, look at all these names. Like I'm about to, I'm trying to.